With these, I'd like to give everybody time to attempt the problem on their own, and then we'll discuss the solution just so that you can kind of start reviewing for our final exam. So think about the two problems that you can see on the screen now, and I'll give everybody about a minute to work through them. Are y'all able to read all of them? Clear enough on your screen? Okay, good. So yes, work Okay, great. Thank you, Juan, for the feedback. Work through these, and we'll start talking about it about 9.36. That's two minutes from now, and then we'll just keep doing the same pattern. Think about it, talk about it for the whole class. And it was asked when's the final, that information will be given at the end of our chapter two review. I thought we'd just get started with that first. So as we work through this one, we know the first thing is that sets can be described by a verbal description. And whenever you're trying to match the verbal description to what you see on the screen, you want to make sure that if somebody else read that description, they would write down the exact same thing. So we really want to be specific and precise. Now, a few of the things that we pay attention to are the dot, dot, dots without anything after. It just means the pattern continues in that direction as you'd expect. So here I see there's some dot, dot, dots that are before. So we would think that, you know, it was starting at negative one, then negative two, negative three, negative four. So the pattern seems to be we're going through negative integers. So the dot, dot, dot means negative five is next, negative six is next, and it would continue on without stopping. Now, um, how would I choose between these two? What would be the deciding factor? Because they're both mentioned the word negative and they both mention integers. One of them is all of the integers and then the other one is just the even number in integers. Perfect, that's the key word. That even really makes the difference there. I also saw that in the chat correctly. And if y'all look here, these are not just the even negative integers, right? That would be like negative two, negative four, negative six, but we've got one, we've got three, we've got five. So that would tell us that it's all the negative integers, not just a certain grouping. Great, do we feel pretty confident about those type of problems? Okay. And this is review, so with any of these, if y'all would like more problems created like that for additional practice, just reach out either verbally or in the chat and I can create additional problems. Now here we did have some symbols um, in, not in, subset, proper subset. So as y'all read through this one, this would say five is, this is a symbol for in, which is a member of this set. And this set contains negative two, zero, two, four, six, eight. Does five seem to be a part of that set? No, right? So this would be a false statement. It is not correct that five is in this set because five is not there. Now let's look at the next one. Is four, and here, remember the slash through means not in. So is four not in this set? This is kind of tricky, right? Because it's the, is it true that it's not in there? And I would say it seems to be here, right? Four is in the set. So it's not true that it's not in the set. 
So we would say this is also false. And sometimes whenever the not things are false, it can be a little bit confusing. So just ask yourself, is that correct or not? If it's correct, it's true. If it's not correct, it's false. Okay, because four is actually in the set. Now, could I just look here and say, oh, A is not listed here, so it's not in the set? No, because there's no expectation that sets are ordered in a certain way, right? You'd have to check every element. And if you look farther, we see A is part of the set. So this would be a true statement. And then for this one, how do we go about thinking about this? Because I don't see 12 over 5 written. Does that mean this is a false statement? Good. So even though it's not written, do you see the pattern is set that the bottom numbers stay the same? So we should expect everything to be over 5. And what's happening to the top numbers is they're the even numbers that are positive. So next we'd expect 10 over 5. Next we'd expect 12 over 5. So it is in the set indicated by the dot, dot, dot telling us the pattern continues. So that's also true. Any questions there or anything that you'd like additional practice with? Okay, just remember this is y'all's review time, so feel free to ask at any point. Think about this next question. Okay, and let's say this one's number one and this is number two. When you get your idea, type it in the chat, like F for finite, I for infinite. What y'all think for these, just to get a gauge on the classes. Great Jordan, great Georgia. Now the word finite and infinite, we can recall it means finite is you could count all the items in the list. Eventually there will be a last element. But infinite means it's going to go on forever and ever. There will never be an end to the membership in the list. Perfect, Cleo, exactly right. So our finite is the first one, right? There's only four elements. But the detail on the second one is this dot, dot, dot means it's going to continue forever, which is infinite. But the one thing we need to keep track of is just because there's a dot, dot, dot doesn't always mean it's infinite. Because what if I had this dot, dot, dot? Since something comes after it, this means the pattern continues until you get to this point. So it's kind of a way to not write the middle pieces. So in this case, our new one, would we agree this one is finite? Good. Think about our next one. Type your answer in the box or in the chat. Remember, this notation is the number of elements in the set. This is our set, how many elements are there. And within sets, repetition does not count as separate items. Thanks everybody for the feedback so far in the chat. Now, as we're thinking about this, the key idea is one thing I highly encourage everybody to do is for your final exam and for the chapter 10 exam, if you haven't taken it yet, bring blank pieces of paper with you. You are allowed scratch paper, just show the webcam at the beginning that it's blank. 
because there's some problems that you'd benefit from being able to write down and interact with. And I think this is one of them. So say I wrote this down, make sure you copy it correctly. Then on my paper, I could say, okay, this is one, two, but we remember that sets repetition doesn't count as a separate element. So since I already accounted for three, I don't account for it again here or here. Those are just all the same threes. And then there's a new element four and a new element eight. So think about like distinct items. Repetitions don't count, so there should be four distinct items in all. One, two, three, four. Would be the answer there. Okay, think about these ones. Um, a definition to remember is in chapter two, we talked about equivalent means it has the same number of elements in each set, whereas equal is not only do they have the same number of elements, but the elements themselves are exactly the same. So that's our distinction between equivalent and equal. Correct, Jordan, well done. And I did want to just remind everybody, if you look at our syllabus, the final exam is 30% of the grade. So um, you should study for it. And I definitely recommend people take advantage of this week of review that we have to actively engage now, because this is just time where you can highlight areas that you need to study further, certain sections. So remember the exam is 30% of your course grade and it has the opportunity to replace one of your lowest chapter exam grades if it helps your grade. So the final exam will count for everybody, it's 30%. So you do wanna prepare for it because somebody could easily you know, have an A average and if they just don't take the final exam, 90% minus 30%, that means that you automatically have a D in the class. So don't not prepare for the final. You know, This is just review of the things that we've already learned. So in this case, a comma B is equivalent to one comma two. Since it says equivalent and not equal, this is a true statement because all equivalent means is they have the same number of elements in each set. The number of elements in here is two. The number of elements in here is two. Now, if they had said this, A comma B equals one comma two, that's a false statement because these things are not equal. Uh, Lauren, um, they're not, I don't have a separate document. I'm writing on it right now. So I can post the written on ones, but I'm not going to post the blank ones because I don't have those as a separate file. As I'm writing over, it's kind of overwriting it. But I will post the ones that we've written on. Yes, but don't see these as a copy of the final, right? These are just additional review problems. It's kind of just a general idea. Now for the next one, this one is false because this has three and this only has two, right? So we would say false there. Think about the next one. Perfect, Jordan, well done. Great job, Morgan. And y'all are correct so far from what I'm seeing, this would be false. These are not equal sets because A comma B is not the same as one comma two. Equivalent, but not equal. Now we get into the idea of subset. So remember, we've talked about element membership where a single item is in a set. Now we're saying, is this collection of items in this set? So it's the membership of multiple items. And the way subsets work is you had two symbols this is just subset, not equal. So this is the general symbol. This means it's a subset and maybe it's equal. We don't really care, but it's at least a subset. This one is the stricter statement. This is saying it is a subset and the two things are definitely not equal. Okay, because notice the line has gone. So just imagine your mind, it means 
it's definitely not the same thing. So when you're checking subset, remember the order of the symbol matters. Since the C shape is opening over here, we're asking, is this a subset of this? And the way you check that is you say, OK, every element here should be in here. So one is in the first one, one is in the second one. And you just do element by element check. Three is in the first one, three is in the second one. Do we agree every element of the first one is in the second one? So it is true that it's a subset. Now, as I look at the next one, think if that's also true. So in this case, this is also true. We know that one is here, one is here, three is here, three is here. And would we agree the two things are definitely not equal? So all you have to have for this symbol is they are subsets, check, and they're definitely not the same thing. So that'd be a true statement. However, this one comma three is a subset of one comma three. That's true but consider this statement, if this is true or not. So I would read this as, this is a symbol for they are subsets, but they're not equal. So I think we'd agree that they are subsets, right? Everything in the first set is in the second set but they are equal sets, right? So this would be a false statement. These are not proper subsets because they're equal. Another way that you could write this is you could say they're not proper subsets, right? If you draw a line through it, you negate the statement. Okay. Think about our next one, whether it would be true or false. And I mean, where I got these questions, because it was asked, I will post this document with the solutions to it. I just went through your chapter two exam and I changed a lot of the problems slightly. So it's the exact same structure, just different questions for review. Great job, Jordan. So this one, remember you always just check one at a time. It might be helpful to write it down. So is A here? Yep. B is here, B is here. However, F has no location in the second set, right? And you have to have one set fitting completely inside the other set. So since that doesn't have a place, this is false. They can't be subsets. Now for this one, um, you're given a universal set U. Now I've zoomed out so we can see all the problems. Are we able to read clearly everything on the screen? Y'all can still see it. Okay, thanks Morgan. So with this, I'm gonna give everybody a few minutes to attempt these. So in some cases, like whenever it has this statement, you need to determine whether it's true or false. And the way I'd recommend doing that is if A union B isn't something that's already written, off to the side, write it, and then say, is that really a subset of C? True or false, figure that out. Think about is A a subset of B, proper subset, so true or false. Here, you'd actually want to construct what is the set A intersects C, write it on your paper based on what A is, based on what C is. Remember, this intersect, the upside down U, means it's in this set and the other set. The correct shaped U is this set or this set. And then we've got A complement, which is everything that's in the universal set, but not in A. So there's a few problems here. So let's take, tell about 957 or 58. 
And when you finish these, just send in the chat that you're done so I can get an idea on pacing. I'll let everybody have a time to attempt it on their own, and then we'll discuss them. Now, as we work on this one, I think the first thing would be to actually write out what is A union B on our paper so that we can actually see if that's a subset of C. You know, anything that describes something new, it's good to write out. So in terms of union, that's what this symbol is. That just means take everything from A. So I'm just copying that down. And then add in anything from B that you haven't already included. And if you want, you can write down repetitions, but we know they don't matter, so I can also just not repeat items. So I have not written down B, so I, or four, I need to write down four. I do already have five written down and I do already have seven written down. So if I wanted to, I could say five comma seven repeated, but it's not necessary, right? Since repetition doesn't matter. So this is A union B. And now let's ask ourselves: is this a subset of C, which I'm gonna write next to it, two, four, six. And just looking at it, I think we could say definitely no. A larger set can't be a subset of a smaller set, right? There is, I think, what? Six distinct elements in A union B and only three in C. So we don't even have to compare. This is definitely false. I don't have to do element by element comparison. Now is A a proper subset of B? Now remember proper subset means subset, but also definitely not the same thing. So if it helps me on my paper, I would write out the right order A, one, two, three, five, seven. And I'd say, is this a subset of B, four, five, seven? Well, to check proper subset, first you have to have regular subset. And we would we agree that this has more things, so it's definitely not a subset of the smaller thing. Okay, and if it's not a regular subset, it definitely can't be a proper subset, which is a stronger criteria. So this is also false. And had it been reversed, had it been, is B a subset, proper subset of A? Let's consider that as four, five, seven. 
a proper subset of one, two, three, five, seven. Okay. Now, as you're checking proper subset, first just check, is it a regular subset? And if it is, and they're not equal, it's a proper subset, right? So checking regular subset, wouldn't we take the first element over here and see, is it in the other set? Which it isn't, four is not a part of here. So automatically they're not proper subsets because they're not regular subsets. So you've got to have the smaller group is lives inside the other one. So how do we feel about these two problems so far? Good, okay. Now the next one, for the intersect, we have to list out what it is. So let's look, what is in common between A and C? It looks like they have got a two in common. They don't have a three in common, the five's not in common. This, I think we agree there's only two in common. So we would list it out or we would select the option that just had two as their intersection. Now for A complement, oops. For a complement, you take everything that is in the universal set U that is not already in A. So I'm just going to mark out the things in U that are also in A. We can't have one because it's in A. We can't have two because it's in A. We can't have three. Four is not in A, so it's okay. But five is in A, so it's not okay. Six is not in A, so it's okay. But seven is in A. So the unmarked things are the things that are in A complement. It's the things that's in the universal set, but not a member of A. So that would be just four and six. So look to the universal set and just mark everything that's in the original. Anything left over is in your complement. And with this, do we see the benefit of writing some of this down so you can actually kind of make these marks, right? This would be hard to just mentally focus on the computer screen and see. Now we had two formulas towards the end of these sections, which were the formulas for possible subsets and proper subsets. As a reminder, the possible subsets formula was two to the n, where n was the number of elements in the set, distinct elements. And the proper subsets was that formula and then you just subtracted one because you subtracted out the largest subset. So the key idea for using these formulas is knowing how many elements are in the set. So I'll give everybody a moment to attempt that on their own using these formulas for our given set A, B, C, D. Now in both problems, the number of elements is four because there's one, two, three, four distinct elements in the set. So to use a formula, we would say two to the four minus one. Two to the four, if you check in your calculator, someone could verify, I think that's 16, but of course we're not subtracting one for this first one. So the answer is just 16. Now for the next one, if it's proper subsets, it's the number of elements in the set, which is again four, since it's the same one as above. But since it's proper, we then subtract one from it. So we get 16 minus one and we get 15. So for these problems, it's going to be helpful just to have this formula, right? 
Now, our next thing was sometimes we drew Venn diagrams and there were two kind of concepts related to that. We would label locations in a Venn diagram and then we would shade locations in a Venn diagram. So in this case, we've got the sets, the universal set U and the smaller sets inside that A and B. And then you've got four Venn diagram options. Think which one is the correctly labeled Venn diagram. And as a reminder for strategy, I recommend that you look at the most restricted section first, which is always the intersection. Then use process of elimination and move outwards. And I'm changing one thing. I meant to erase that. Correct, Jordan, well done. So I think the first thing I'd look at is their intersection. A, the set A and the set B have the little element B in common and that's it, right? So immediately I could feel confident it's not A or C because they have show BC as the intersection and only B as the intersection. And now as I'm deciphering, do we agree that these agree in their A, which is correct that it only has little element A as its own membership of the circle A and then Capital B also has C, D, E, F, which is included in both of these diagrams. The distinction is what's left over in the universal set that's not a part of A or B. In diagram D, it says there's nothing left over. But so far we have accommodated for A, B, C, D, E, and F. All of these have been selected in either capital A or capital B but we see the universal set still has G and H, which are not accommodated for, which is why B is the correct answer because it shows G and H live outside of both A and B, which is correct, still in the universe, but not in either one of those sets. Okay. And I would say with all of these, particularly this next one, I'd recommend that you would focus on drawing this on your own, shading it, and then seeing which one of the options is correct based on your answer. It's probably going to be harder to look at them and decipher which one and which one's right and wrong for the shading. So take a moment to shade what I've highlighted in green on your own, and then see which one of those matches our options. And in terms of parentheses, remember you shade what's in parentheses first. So visualize what does A union B look like? And then think about how would that look intersected with the set C. Would we agree this is A union B shaded? So that's the first part. 
But then it's not just A union B, we also have to intersect that with C. And if you were going to look at just C shaded, it would look something like this. After you've sketched these two off to the side, think about what it means to intersect. And that should give us our final answer. Now with intersect, you can think about it as the only region that gets shaded in the final version is that which regions are shaded in both separately. So if I look at this region, for instance, here, the outside region, do we agree it's not shaded in either, so it won't be shaded in the intersection? Additionally, this section that's just a part of A, while it's shaded in the first one, is not shaded in the second, so it shouldn't be shaded. The section that A shares with C but not with B is shaded in both, so it should be shaded. The section that A shares with B but not C is shaded in the first but not the second, so it shouldn't be shaded. The section all three share is shaded in both, so it should be shaded. The section that just B has is shaded in the first but not the second, so it shouldn't be shaded in the intersection. The section that B and C share but not A is shaded in both, so it should be shaded in the second. And then finally, the section that just C has is shaded in the second, but not the first. So it shouldn't be shaded in the intersection. That would leave us with only C as our answer because it only has sex sections that are shaded in both of the original diagrams, which is the idea of intersection. Now, if we are looking at union, this is almost the union. This would be the union if we, in addition, shaded this section as well, right? If all the three circles were shaded together, that would be the union of the two things. Now we also, this is kind of like the labeling. Sometimes we have a list and we remember that these lists are not necessarily distinct individuals. We remember back to our survey, you know, you ask who can do this, somebody raises their hand, who can do this other thing, some of the same people might have raised their hand, right? So when you read four people can do drywall, six people can do roofing, six people can do electrical, you shouldn't say, oh, that means we definitely have um, 16 people working, because some of those people are multiple skills. And as we were labeling this in a proper Venn diagram to kind of tease out who has each skill, we always said, go to the most specific things first. So some of the pieces of information were like, two can do all three. Think about where that would be in the Venn diagrams and kind of eliminate some options. And then go to the next restrictive ideas that some people can do two skills and kind of work your way through. So let's take a minute or so to work on this. I'll zoom in a bit.
Now, as we're working through this one, I think this is a key piece of information. If you haven't focused on it yet, think about what it tells you along with this one about which ones can be eliminated from consideration. So they all agree that two can do all three and the all three is this section, right? where all three circles intersect and they all have two in this section. So we're not going to be able to decipher anything by just looking here because they're all in agreement there. So what we do is we go to the next restrictive sections and we see that two can do both drywall and roofing. Now I my second monitor uh, turned off unexpectedly. So I, I can't see y'all's face. Can y'all still see my screen just to make sure that we're all here? Oh, it turned back on, so we're good. Thank you guys. I think sometimes it loses a little connection. So the first one, two can do all three, doesn't change anything in terms of deciphering. But the fact that two can do drywall and roofing, we want to keep in mind what section is drywall and roofing. This is the drywall circle that I've highlighted in pink. This is the roofing circle. Do we agree and is the idea of intersection? So drywall and roofing would be this section in all three of these. That's drywall and roofing. Now, how many people are supposed to be in this section? Two, it said. Two can do drywall and roofing. We already know that these two people have to be there because two can do all three. So do we agree that of the items, this is already fixed. This is immutable. Now, drywall and roofing is made up of those two little sections combined. So if you're looking here, how many people are actually included in the drywall and roofing category? Three, right? But it said only two. So that's what excludes A and B from further consideration. Oh, no, not B. Sorry about that. B has zero, so that's good. That should be A and C, because these are showing three people in drywall and roofing. So with that, we've kind of whittled us down to B and D. Now, B and D, if you look at them, and again, you could just draw out the whole diagram, see which one's the right one. That works as well. If you're trying to kind of eliminate options, another way that you could do that is you could say, well, what do they agree on? They agree here, they agree here. You wanna find the point of disagreement because then you can figure out who's right and who's wrong, right? Would y'all agree everything inside the three circles B and D agree on? Their big distinction is the fact that B has this little one outside of all the three circles, whereas in the outer section, D has nothing. And the way we would interpret that in the context of the problem is option D shows that nobody has skills or everybody who's a part of the current work crew has one of the three skills. And for option B, we would say one of the people there did not have the three skills asked about, but we can assume has another skill that wasn't asked about. Now there's gonna be one key piece of information to tell us this, because if you notice all the bullet points are about those three skills. So kind of read through the problem and try to fixate on the idea that tells us about that extra information. It's very slight. It's the fact that 10 workers on the job and all. Now, since these two diagrams agree in the middle sections, we can count how many people have already been accounted for. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So the three skills accounts for 10 workers already. And if there's 10 workers in all, do we have space to have an additional worker outside of the 10 we've already accounted for? No. Perfect, exactly right. So we would say D is our right answer. Now, had that been there are 11 workers, do we see in that case B would be the right answer? 
So look for that small detail after you've already accounted for everybody. Any questions here? If you ever have questions about any of this, remember, um, and also, you could also ask what sections these come from. I can remember generally what they are. And we do have class recordings. So you could go back to the beginning of the semester and watch the class recording from that section if you'd like additional practice with any of these. So read through it and think about what your answer, what would you type in for this one? Perfect, Jordan. Great work, Morgan. Now here, we know that it said how many workers do not have the three skills, so we don't want to, we're not interested in the drywall, electrical, or roofing skill. This is the people who have drywall skill. This is people with electrical. This is the people with roofing. And all, if you're in either of these three circles, you have one of those three skills, right? So we don't care about any of the people in here. What that leaves is four people on the outside. These four people have a skill other than those three. And if we had asked for how many people have the roofing skill, type your answer in the chat. Roofing. So I think for the roofing, we would say there is one and then three, so that's four together, plus zero still is at four, plus two, right? So I think we should get six. Because everybody in that roofing circle counts as somebody with the roofing skill. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Because since they're sectioned off like this, we automatically, we don't have any repeats, right? They're all distinct individuals. Oops. Okay, our last ideas from chapter two is at the end we learn this formula that the number of elements in A union B equals the number of elements in A plus the number of elements in B minus the number of elements in their intersection. And this information can kind of be filled in and manipulated based on what you have. And there's a great visual for this. And we also saw this formula in terms of our counting ideas that we saw later in chapter 11 and even in probability in chapter 12. So this is A and B. What they're saying here is A union B is all of this, right? That's the left side of the equation. Now what the formula says is what you could do is you could count the number of elements in A in the first set And you could count the number of elements in B. And do we see what I've done with that? Since the intersection is a part of A and it's a part of B, do we see that we've counted it two separate times? So we've counted the same things twice, which is why we subtract that out. It's saying, well, then take away one of the things that you overcounted. That's why this formula works. So in these two questions, you've been given information about the number of elements in A, B, the union, or the intersection, and you're asked to find the missing piece. So let's all take a few minutes to set up this formula, fill in the missing pieces of information you have, and then use algebra to find the last piece.
Does anybody need more time to work on these ones? So in this case, you write in the formula, we know that the number in A union B is the number of A plus the number of B. If you write this down, then it helps you organize everything correctly. Now the number in A union B, we were told is 20. So that gets replaced with a 20. The number in A is 10. plus the number of B is 12 minus, now we don't know the intersection, but if you know everything except one thing, you can use algebra to solve for it. So this simplifies to 20 equals 22 minus A intersect B, the number in that. Now, while we could do algebra to solve this, if we just think about it, it will be fast, right? 20 is equal to 22 minus what? Do we agree two? So you could isolate and solve for the number in A intersect B, but you could also just think about it. If I subtract two from 22, I'll get 20. Doing something similar here, it's just we're given different pieces of information. We know that the number in the union is 18 equals the number in each individual set minus their intersection. So this becomes 18 equals the number in A plus eight minus six gives us an overall plus two. So what plus two equals 18? I believe we should get 16. 